Hello. Hello. Thanks. Hi, um, welcome to the final session of the day. It's been a fantastic day so far. We've heard from people like Activision, Sawhorse, uh, the crypto industry, covered a real broad range of subject matters. And I'm particularly excited about this one because Geek are a fantastic company that are actually spending time really getting under the skin of data and how the metaverse works. So they've you know come a long way in a short amount of time and they're working with some incredible brands just basically on the education of what's the right thing to do when you're looking into the metaverse, whether it's fashion or sport. So I will now hand you over for a fantastic insight into that world. Thank you very much. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I know it's the end of the day. So last presentation, I promise. And uh, hopefully this should be interesting uh, for all of you here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the state of brand experiences inside virtual worlds. That word metaverse has been used a lot. Sometimes it's abused. Some people don't know what it is. I quite frankly, still I'm a bit confused by it. So we're going to use the word virtual, virtual environments in, in this presentation. And um, I just want to start by taking a real step back and just saying what world we live in at the moment. Um, I believe everyone, and there's this stat which I'm going to get completely wrong, so don't quote me on it, but we're hit by around 200 adverts before 10 a.m in the morning when we're on the way to work. And that's because we live in an attention economy. Every single brand out there is really trying to vie for your attention. Um, so if we look at the evolution of attention, how do brands reach audiences? Well, if it was pre-2000, what you were limited to was very much print, TV, and radio as communication verticals to, to, to reach these audiences. And there were gatekeepers with uh, TV, print, and radio. There were companies that kind of owned the audiences behind those verticals. Um, if you were a fashion brand and you wanted to get in front of the fashion audience, you had to speak to Condé Nast to go into Vogue. Um, something happened in the sort of mid-2000s where it was the rise of digital, and particularly with social media, is actually uh, there were new gatekeepers and eyeballs started moving from left to right there. And it was no longer Condé Nast that you had to get in touch with to reach audiences, it was Facebook. I'll remind people that at that time, I think there were a lot of brands, particularly fashion brands, who said we couldn't possibly go onto Facebook. Uh, it's full of a bunch of university students. Now, every single fashion brand has a social media team. Um, this is the industry and the area that, that Geek plays in, which is virtual worlds and virtual environments. And we, we see this as a kind of evolution of what was that middle one, social media. Um, and with the evolution of eyeballs going from left to right there, um, there's also an evolution of gatekeepers. So actually, it's no longer Facebook that you need to get in touch with to reach your audience. It's actually Roblox that owns the eyeballs. It's Fortnite that owns the eyeballs. It's Rec Room. It's Minecraft. Um, Zepete. So that's the area that Geek plays in, and that is the evolution of, of attention, where attention, where time is being spent. So what's happening right now is there's a kind of battle for attention, and uh, it's being measured in time spent. So if we look at the reasons why Facebook has changed to Meta, and a big reason why um, I started Geek with my co-founders back in 2018 was because Facebook was one of my clients at a previous company I was working at. And uh, they were essentially looking at gaming as an opportunity to reach audiences. And I was quite confused. I said, why are you looking at gaming? And they said, they kind of looked at me like I was a bit of an idiot and said, well, Charles, Obviously, gaming is an evolution of social media. Um, the people are going inside these games not just to play anymore. They're actually going inside to socialize. Now, if these individuals are going inside to socialize, what does that mean for us as a business? It means that we're going to become on, obsolete. It's so obviously four, four or five years later, we saw that they came out with Meta. They're giving it a go. I'm still very bullish on them, but it's going to take some time. 
Um, so if we look at uh, where the time is being spent and it's being measured uh, for Gen Z, by the way, Gen Z is, what is it? It's, it's 12 to 27 year olds. So I think people think Gen Z are just teenagers and only teenagers, just to be absolutely clear, they're in their late 20s now. Um, and the number one platform is, you guessed it, it's Roblox, uh, spending 180 minutes uh, a, a day on that particular platform. The second one is TikTok. That's the one that everyone talks about with regards to Gen Z spending time on TikTok. It's true, they do spend a lot of time on TikTok. However, um, three trillion hours of content is, or three trillion uh, views of content is gaming video content views, so gaming uh, views related. The next one, let's see what it is, it's YouTube. So a lot of time is being spent on YouTube, but then again, a lot of the content that's being distributed on YouTube is actually gaming video content. So even in the traditional verticals, they are looking at gaming content um, as a channel to engage with. Minecraft, next one, 48 minutes. And then we have Instagram. I think if we speak to anyone under the age of 20 years old and say, where are you hanging out with your friends? It's pretty unlikely they say Facebook. It's actually quite unlikely they say Instagram. It's more likely they say TikTok and Snapchat, but then importantly, Fortnite and Roblox will be in that conversation. Um, and then we have these other platforms as well, most of which are games. So time is being spent in these games. Now, if we look at games, let's talk about how they're split because 3.2 billion people play games apparently. 1.2 billion people watch other people play games, and there's around 450 million that watch people play professional video game playing, which is esports. So if we think about the first ecosystem, uh, that would be UGC gaming platforms. Now, UGC gaming platforms are the Fortnite, the Sepeto equivalents, and there's some real advantages with these platforms, when, particularly when brands are looking at integrating into these experiences. And the big one is the player base. This is where the audience is. If I think back into 2020 and the time at which everyone was piling into the metaverse, these were the platforms that everyone was talking about. It was the Decentralands, it was the Sandbox. But the reality of the situation is, and that old saying, fish where the fish are, the fish aren't there. Now, the reason why a lot of brands were going into those spaces is because the objective, I hope the objective, unless they got it wrong, wasn't to connect with people, it was to get press and PR. Now, there are advantages with these particular platforms, is it's NFT compatible, so those brands that were coming out with their NFT um, uh, uh, projects, they could attach some utility into these worlds. But the issue is, is the player base. They really didn't command the player base and they are still existing today. I think they, uh, they received a lot of funding. They made a lot of money on crypto. They are desperately trying to get the audience that's actually in here. And then finally, there's this kind of other option, which is new, I suppose, but it's what we call own worlds. And that wor that's where brands don't have to rely on going into a platform like Roblox or a platform like uh, Sandbox. They can actually build their own virtual world on their website. And I think you would probably call this immersive e-com. And businesses like Imperia and Obsess and Beyond XR are, are doing that. And that's fantastic. I mean, it's amazing because you are completely uh, you can get all the data you want because you own it. You're completely unlimited in terms of what you want to build. But the major issue is, again, is there is no player base. You have to attract the audience to go into your experience. And not only that, you have to retain them. Now, later in the presentation, I'm going to talk more about them because I've got some quite interesting predictions to where that's going. Right, so I just want to talk about um, how brands uh, integrate into gr games and how it's changed over time. And the reality of the situation is gaming has been around for decades and people have been playing games for decades. And actually, brands have actually been integrating into games for decades. I think it was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 back in the 90s where you saw vans in there. Um, but there are some issues and the issues were a high barrier to entry. So actually, because they were one developer creating one game, like Pokemon Go here, 
Um, it's up to Pokemon Go to decide whether they want the brand to go into that game to reach their 80 million users. So very, very limited in terms of, well, if you want to go in there because the demographics of Pokemon Go matches your audiences, it's up to Pokemon Go whether they're going to accept you. One issue. The second one is the cost of these integrations are incredibly expensive. And that's because there's one builder. So the longer the lead time is, the, I mean, these sort of activations take six months at the absolute minimum, normally one year. So effective, you can get your brand in this game, but it's going to take you a long time. It's going to be very expensive, and the game not even accepts you as a brand. The second thing is these were sort of temporary activations. So they were very, very campaign driven. So you wouldn't go in and kind of stay in there forever. You would go in for a period of time, and then the game will say, OK, you're done. We've got your money, and we're going to kick you out of the game, which means that you don't actually ever own the audience. You're going in there to get eyeballs, and then you're coming out. It's not very scalable. So for the future of immersive entertainment and the future of immersive social media, having one developer that's accepting all of these different brands, it's not possible. They can only accept one at a time with these lead times. Right, so this has been the case for a very long period of time, and, and, and Gucci was Geek's first customer, and a lot of the work that we did were activations like this at the start, and these activations still happen today. We saw that Porsche yesterday went into the Overwatch uh, uh, game, I think it's Overwatch 2, that would have been a traditional game activation, so it still happens. Now, big game-changing thing that happened in the last five years was the rise of these user-generated content games, where actually it's not about one developer because these aren't games, these are platforms to empower individuals to create their own experiences. What does that mean? It means because there's not one developer, it's a much lower barrier to entry, and actually it's not up to Roblox who goes in. It's a bit like when you create an Instagram profile. Anyone can go into Instagram and create that profile. So that also allows for shorter lead times because you can work with, I think we just saw Nick here from Sawhorse. You can work with Sawhorse to build inside Roblox. Um, the other thing is you can have a persistent experience inside these UGC uh, uh, games. What does that mean? It, it, it really means that actually you get to own your audience. I think Nick from Sawhorse was talking about Allo Yoga. Allo Yoga has almost 100 million visits, I believe. And that is a constant flow of individuals coming to that experience of which that brand can do what they want with those individuals. They can use Flaunt to drive loyalty. They can sell digital goods, um, uh, consistently get engagement. That's scalable. And that's the word that's really important. Because actually, if we're talking about the evolution of social media and we're talking about a place where users can come in and socialize and see each other and kind of live, play, work, um, it needs to be scalable. And certainly for brands, a big blocker has been that scalable approach. So that's what I would just want to hit home here a bit is not all games are the same. UGC games are very different to traditional games, and the implications that it has on brands is very, very different too. OK, so now let's talk about the data a little bit. On If we're looking at UGC games being the future of social media, um, what is the landscape of these UGC virtual environments? These are your options. So, we start with Roblox. I mean, you're probably so tired of hearing that word, but you're going to hear it a lot in this particular presentation. Roblox, if we go back to sort of 2005, 6, 7, Roblox is the Facebook equivalent of social media. It's the biggest player in the industry. They have 300 million monthly active users growing rapidly. The next one is Minecraft. Not many people know this, but you can actually go into Minecraft and build your own server and build your own experience there, and it's a huge user base very different demographics. One has to remember these different UGC platforms command different demographics. Um, then we got Fortnite at 100 million monthly active users. And then The Sims 4, another thing, not many people know that actually in The Sims 4, you can go in there and upload your own content. You do need to go to EA to get their permission. So it's sort of semi-UGC, I would say. 
Um, and then we have Rec Room. Rec Room is a UGC platform that is uh, uh, a VR first, but they are available on mobile now. Um, then we've got two others where the logo is not there, but I'm going to hazard a guess that that's Sepeto at 20 million. Sepeto is a really, really interesting platform and one you should all look at that we'll talk about later. Underneath that, I can't remember, but underneath that we have Decentraland and the Sandbox. And remember what I spoke about when uh, all of these brands rushed in to these virtual worlds. The thing that I think if they're... Um, if their objective was to reach audiences, the thing they didn't look at was this, which is actually the number of people going inside these platforms. So, the rest of the gaming industry is looking at these UGC platforms with envious eyes. They know that this is the future of their own IP as well. So this is uh, the CEO of EA, and EA has a host of different gaming titles, traditional gaming titles, but they are actually looking at the Robloxes and the Fortnites, and they're going, that's exactly the direction we're heading into, games as platforms. And it was quite interesting, because uh, I think FIFA, that well-known football game, now uh, I think it's called EAFC, they released a social feature inside the latest game of that, and they saw a 150% increase in terms of their user retention. So one continues to ask oneself the question, are people going into these games to play, or are they going in to actually catch up with their friends? And the reality of the situation is the game mechanic, the game mechanic is the excuse for going in. What keeps them there is actually there. It's an excuse for catching up with their friends. EA know it, Roblox and Sepeto and these others aren't the only ones who are gonna be doing this. The other gaming platforms will be doing it. So, okay, so that's great. We've got these games of an evolution of social media. What does this mean? Well, this is an unprompted uh, panel of Gen Z. Gen Z's most loved brands. Great, okay, that's really interesting. It looks like that Nike's number one and then we have Gucci and then Adidas and H&M. But it's quite interesting when we overlay some data here and we look at the activations that these brands have done inside virtual worlds. And we're seeing a bit of a correlation between Gen Z's most loved brands and the brands who have actually activated inside this new space. I mean, it's not rocket science. If we took ourselves back to 2005, 6, 7, when all these brands went into uh, traditional social media, fish where the fish are, if you're where they are, then it sounds like they're going to sort of um, um, love you. Right. So what, what does this mean for a brand, essentially? What does this mean now that I have this new communication vertical? Well, of course, a brand like Gucci will have a strategy for TikTok. They'll have a strategy for their Facebook audience. They'll have a strategy for their uh, X, formerly known as Twitter audience. They'll have a strategy for Instagram, and you can probably see where this is going. They'll have a strategy for YouTube. But I can tell you right now, they've got a team that's fully dedicated to these new emerging communication channels. And this is always on. You know, you don't create an Instagram profile, put it up, get a bunch of followers and delete it. And this is exactly how a lot of these brands are looking at this space. So they will have strategies for these other platforms as well. By the way, the one in the middle, quite confusing, it's called SuperQQ. China has a very different ecosystem, but I would say the Roblox equivalent in China, because Roblox isn't available in China, would be SuperQQ. So what that means is it's not just Gucci that is seeing the industry in this way, but it's all these other brands. And this kind of shows you uh, the virtual representation of the brand in these 3D e well, these 3D platforms. Um, you know, a, a brand will express itself in traditional social media, but they are limited to words, image, and video. What these platforms allow is these brands to express themselves in ways they couldn't possibly do using traditional media. And that's a big reason why a lot of these brands go in. Yes, it's to reach new uh, audiences. Of course, it's to open up new revenue streams. But actually, this is about storytelling and expressing your brands in ways that you can't possibly do in other ways. 
So we've got an issue now. So, you know, and I think this was discussed on the last panel, but how do we understand this and how do we measure this and what is the comparison apples to oranges? Well, I go back to how important the attention economy is. And if we think about attention, we've got to think about time spent. And if we think about time spent, we've got to think about what a brand's media mix is. So if we think about a brand's media mix, where are they spending money? They're spending money on out-of-home media buying, which are the billboards. They're spending money on linear television. They're spending money on radio. They're spending money in social media. Let's do a comparison of the amount that they're spending on social media, which, by the way, the budgets are pretty big there, and the engagement they're getting back in terms of time spent to these new immersive platforms. Now, just to be absolutely clear, this is H&M. H&M have uh, multiple different social channels of which this is aggregated and shown. You can see the month of Jan January there, almost 300,000 minutes. How do we calculate this? You can look at the average uh, like rating based on the number of likes they got. That's a number of uh, seconds that goes to, to the user. If they comment, it's a bit more. If it's an impression, it's probably less than a second. If we add up all this information and then we compare that to H&M's Roblox experience, the, the sort of chalk and cheese-ness of this situation is pretty obvious. Um, there's a lot more time being spent in these immersive platforms than there are in traditional social media. Just to be clear, in May, I believe they were releasing their latest fashion show, whatever it is. But even then, it was quite close to their, to their Roblox experience. But out of the five months of that time, every single one was in Roblox. To be absolutely clear, this is combination of their um, social channels, which includes Instagram, it includes TikTok, it includes YouTube. Oh, this is all fast forward. Let me go back. You didn't see this. OK, <laughs> right. See if I can go to the next slide here. OK, stay there. Stay there. Great. So um, this poses the question, what is Geek? What do we do here? Well. Actually, um, if we think about the traditional channels uh, in TV, print, and radio, some people love Nielsen, some people hate Nielsen, but the reality of the situation is they do measurement and attribution, and they changed measurement for television. There's a lot of brands out there that you know, they will ask for the Nielsen School when they do a TV campaign. And that's incredibly important to understand what return on investment you got back, how it compares to a benchmark. Um, a whole new set of tools were created when social media came out. I'm thinking Brandwatch, Tubular Labs, several of them. Uh, we Geek is basically that, but for virtual worlds. So for brands to really understand, and before they go in to say, right, what is it that um, I, what, how do I know whether this is success, uh, a success factor, the Geek score is incredibly important. Um, we're incredibly lucky. You know, this was a business that was founded roughly five years ago. And uh, I still can't believe that we're working with all these individual brands uh, in this space. Um, we started with fashion. Why fashion? Well, fashion is pretty easy to translate the virtual world and physical world. When you've got avatars, you may want to put on clothes. And it's very easy to put on clothes on your avatar. But I actually believe that fashion was quite slow to social media. I said before that fashion brands, when Facebook came out, they said, we can't possibly advertise in Facebook. It's a bunch of university students. We belong in Vogue magazine. Now, as we all know, social media is incredibly important to these fashion brands. I think as soon as they saw this space come up, they said, this is happening again. And we're not going to be late to this. So that's why you're seeing a lot of fashion brands uh, leading the charge in this space, is my belief. Right, let's go a bit deeper into the data now. So. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that we do at Geek is we track all of the virtual environments, all of the UGC platforms, all of the gaming platforms, and we track all of the brand activation. So what's going on here? Well, what we're looking at is Q1 2021, and we're looking at the change and mix of virtual environments that there are in the number of brands that are going in. Um, you'll see from Q1 2021, these are, this is based on quarters, and these are new brands going in. This is not accumulative. Um, you can see how it's changing over time. And actually, 
uh, Q4 of 2023 was a record-breaking quarter for brands entering this space. I think everyone uh, is aware of the press and PR that's out there saying the metaverse is dead. Uh, that's not from what we can see over here. So there's over 200 plus brands just in Q4 alone that have entered the space. Um, we released a report uh, back in summer last year of uh, Q2 and the total number of brands in the space was 350 and the number of activations that they had done was 500. Why are there more activations than brands? Well, it's a bit like social media. You don't just go into Instagram, you might go into Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. So that's why there are more activations than there are brands. The really interesting thing is in two quarters alone, there are now over 700 brands that have entered this space that have created over a thousand different uh, experiences. So rapidly growing uh, industry and continuing to grow. So let's delve into Roblox, the, the monster. Roblox is the biggest one for brands. And what does it look like? Well, uh, in the last quarter, 220 of those um, uh, brands were, were, were entering Roblox. So Roblox is the, is the beast when it comes to this. They are accepting most of these brands. And you can see here how small it was back in uh, 2019. I think we put Gucci in, in Q3 of 2020, so um, quite early. There are also record numbers on Fortnite. So it's not just Roblox that uh, brands are looking at. Fortnite is, is, is also growing rapidly, and the last quarter was huge for Fortnite. Um, just to be absolutely clear, the top is 120 there, and that's 70. So the scale's a bit off, but you can see the growth is massive. Question is, is, is Fortnite a challenger for the sort of Roblox crown? Well, uh, we will see. These platforms are very, very different, and what you can do in the platforms is very different. I think Roblox is the best all-round package, and the most um, uh, uh, um, they offer the most opportunities for brands. But by God, Fortnite with Unreal Engine and uh, their user base and the fidelity of their experience, it's really, really nice. I'm sure they'll be um, high on the toes. So actually, if we look at um, the growth of Fortnite, you're still, it's still being dwarfed by Roblox, but it is growing. I want to talk a little bit about the rise of integrations. So yes, brands are going into these worlds to uh, build their persistent experiences. But if we look at the data here, and, and these different colors are actually different platforms. Light blue, I believe, is, is Fortnite, and green is Zepetto, and dark blue is Roblox. The growth of integrations is very, very clear. In the last quarter alone, seeing 70 brands in a quarter integrating into other worlds inside Fortnite, inside Roblox. So, just to explain what an integration is, if we take the traditional social media uh, analogy, creating a persistent experience is a bit like creating your Instagram profile. Doing an integration is a bit like going to Kim Kardashian and going on her Instagram stories and reaching her audience for a set period of time. And of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But I think a lot of brands are seeing in integrations as a huge opportunity now. And actually, you can see that by the number of branded persistent experiences versus integrations. It was always persistent experiences constantly. And actually, in Q4 2023 was the first year where it was even the number of integrations versus the number of persistent experiences. So let's see what happens in Q1 of this year. Um, I want to talk a bit about... Uh, uh, an activation that happened on Roblox that I think is uh, really exemplary in terms of uh, uh, utilizing all of the latest technology and really going further down the funnel in terms of success in Roblox. And that's uh, Paris Hilton's recent activation. It wasn't Paris's first time she went into the platform. If we think about Paris Hilton, I mean, she was one of the first to really adopt social media and understand mainstream culture and how you can utilize, utilize that culture. So she's a bit of an expert herself. She knows what she's doing. She was super early into Roblox, super, super early. She knew that this was just 3D social media. And she went in with Paris World in Q4 of 2021. What's really interesting is you can see 
I think this is overlaid by activations on Roblox. She went in and, and I saw Horse did this uh, um, activation, a brilliant production company that, that works with a lot of brands, with Slivingland. Now, why is it that uh, you can see here the, the data on the right is essentially the benchmarks where you're looking at time spent. Remember how I said time spent is, is, is really, really important. Um, how does it compare to these other activations? Why is Slivingland on top in comparison? I've purposely removed the other brands because I just don't want to get in trouble. But um, why is it that Slivingland is, is better than these, these other brands instead of time spent? It's because the way the experience has been crafted is it's been thought through in terms of the game mechanic. It's been thought through in terms of the value add to the player. It's really, really important that. So when a brand is going into these spaces, they've got to think how they are uniquely adding value. Uh, also, I just put this in because I just love this as well. Um, it was uh, 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 not just looking at how we can translate this directly to the Roblox community, but how can we use traditional <laughs> advertising means to show what we're doing in that platform. And I'm not going to talk too much about Flaunt, but it's a really, really great technology. Further down the funnel, how do we get better ROI? Um, this was one of the first of its kind and, and, and should be noted for that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing happen in the future. So I mentioned that fashion was one of the first industries to go into the space and go in a lot. But actually, uh, looking at the data, and this is for Q1 this year in terms of the growth, a lot of the growth that we're seeing is media and entertainment. I think this was the first quarter where media and entertainment brands outpaced fashion brands in terms of integrations and in terms of, well, not many persistent experiences because they're more campaign focused, but we're seeing massive growth in media and entertainment now, beginning to understand it. Um, we're also seeing some huge growth in personal care and cosmetics, food and drink, uh, retail with uh, Walmart, and obviously we spoke about Hilton, uh, Paris Hilton with Hilton Honors in, in travel tourism. Um, and then sports. So all these different industries are activating in this, this space. And a typical question that I get is, as a fashion brand, it's pretty obvious to go in because I'm putting the clothes on my avatar. But really, how do I do this as a food and drinks brand? Because what am I going to do? Have an avatar walk around with a, 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 a can of Monster or something? No. Um, how do you advertise Monster or Red Bull in uh, linear television? It's storytelling. The only difference here is the storytelling is far more enriched than the storytelling on traditional media. So the way you can tell your stories here are really important. So I just want everyone to know that this isn't a space just for brands that are flashy and fashion brands. This is a space for all brands. One just needs to be creative about how you communicate that brand. OK, so with that, um, we're going to talk a little bit about ones to watch in this space. Some of you might be surprised that I pulled these up, but let me just uh, talk you through this. Um, Apple Vision Pro has recently come out. I think VR is amazing. It's incredible. But the problem is, is there's not many people that use it. These are the companies I would really look at quite carefully. I mean, absolutely, it goes without saying that the UGC gaming platforms will continue to grow and continue to be huge. I have no doubt about that. But if we think about Rec Room and uh, the, the daily active users that they have and the monthly active users that they have, it's a really interesting platform. I would look at that platform as uh, receiving some serious growth this year, especially with the rise of Apple Vision Pro and the sort of proclivity to come back to VR. Uh, that's going to be important. VR Chat is another one I would look at. It's a UGC platform, and I remember it's the one that was missing on the logos. Uh, it had 7 million monthly active users, another big one that people should be looking at as well, because that is a very, very authentic VR audience. As VR becomes more important, this platform will become more important. Zepetto is the sort of dark horse. When we think about UGC platforms, we're talking about Roblox and Fortnite the whole time. Zepetto is the sort of third runner, I would say, at the moment. Uh, they have a huge audience in South Korea and Japan and Southeast Asia and a smaller audience in the US. But I would arguably say that Zepetto is the most social out of all of those platforms. So that is one that uh, brands should be looking at. 
And then finally, uh, with the rise of the own worlds that I spoke about at the start, um, the imperiers and the uh, obsessors of this world, I think they're brilliant, they're, they're really beautiful um, designs that are made for three-dimensional e-commerce. But the problem is, is at the moment, living that on a 2D screen and clicking through and sort of Google Street through might not lend itself uh, so well in comparison to um, how Amazon sell things. If, you know, Amazon are very good at selling stuff. If they thought that 3D commerce was gonna increase sales, they'd probably adopt that. However, with hardware changing and VR uh, uh, becoming a much bigger, um, much much more important space over the next coming years. I think these platforms have a really bright future, but in the hard in, when the hardware shifts to to VR. Okay, so um, with that, I thank you all so much for listening to my <laughs> lecture. <laughs> thank you, and have uh, have a wonderful rest of South by Southwest. Thanks. <laughs>